I've noticed that on numerous occasions, Mike says that scripture tells us that the Nephilim were done away with in the Old Testament. Why then are there still instructions that are suggestive of the angels still having potential to be enticed? For instance, if the reference to angels and the head covering harken back to Genesis 6, why is that significant unless cohabitation is still possible? Also, why does it matter if, if a woman's hair is covered in the new covenant? Well, I would say first, you know, the, the wording of the question sort of presumes that the watchers and the sons of God and the Nephilim are kind of the same, but they're not. You know, and I, I, I think, you know, the, the questioner understands that, but the wording, the way the question's worded makes me just wonder a little bit. So I just start there. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11 obviously doesn't mention Nephilim, but the, the gist of the question is, why was Paul concerned? Well, the, the fact that Paul would be concerned about angelic enticement is no justification for arguing that there are Nephilim now. Uh, it, it just means he was concerned. In other words, it means exactly what you would think it would mean, that, that in Paul's mind, that this, this possibility was there. Okay, A possibility is not an actuality. And these are just simple, simple ways of just thinking coherently about the, the, the topic we're discussing. You know, the, the instructions Paul give, you know, really, the, I don't even like the word instructions. You know, the, they're not instructions that Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11 about the head covering in the sense that Paul's saying, do X, because if you don't do X, then Y will happen. Okay, that, isn't, that isn't the sense that, of what Paul's doing. Rather, Paul's advice shows he's you know, he's concerned. He he considers uh, a Genesis 6-like event to, you know, perhaps be possible. That doesn't mean it was happening. It doesn't mean it would happen again. Okay, Paul's just reflecting a, a fear or concern, something, again, that's kind of lurking in the back of his mind. Uh, but there, there's no guarantee that if someone who you know, some woman who listened to Paul and read that and said, well, forget that. I'm leaving my head covered. I'm doing what I want, you know, to flaunt my sexuality. That doesn't mean that something's going to happen to her. In other words, the cause and effect mechanism here uh, is not being taught in 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11 is not teaching a cause-effect reality, and and in some cases even a potentiality. What it, what it does, what Paul's wording suggests is that in his mind, he thought that there was, you know, some, there's a reason to be concerned. There's some possibility here, but we can't sort of convert that possibility in Paul's head to something that would indeed happen. Possibilities are just that. They are possibilities. They are not actualities. A potentiality is not an actuality. Again, I, we, could, we could just go over the, again, the, these terms like this to try to draw the distinction, but I think, you know, that would get a little annoying. So I would just say Paul isn't predicting anything. His words reflect a concern of his. There's no evidence from, from the fact that he was concerned that anything was happening. The Old Testament does make it quite clear that the, 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 the giant clan lines were destroyed. You know, that, that's, that's the whole point of what happens with the Rephaim, the, the remnant there, you know, flees to the cities of the Philistines, that's where we find them next. Goliath and his brothers are taken out. They're exterminated. We never get another reference to them. Uh, even if you're reading the Septuagint, you have a reference to Enochim in Jeremiah, but it's a reference back to the Philistines. You know, it, There's just no evidence for this, zero, in Scripture, that we have a Nephilim presence okay, beyond the Old Testament period, on into the intertestamental period, on into the New Testament. All we can say is that from the way Paul wrote this, he thought that it, it could happen again. In other words, there's nothing in his mind that says it can't happen again, but we can't convert that to saying, oh, it was, or it is. Or if somebody just you know flaunted you know their sexuality, some woman in Corinth, that that it was going to happen. That was the trigger event. You know, it's going to produce this this effect. This is the cause that produces this effect. All of those things are overstatements. They overstate the data. So I don't think we should read into what Paul said. We should just sort of leave it where Paul left it. Second question also is concerning cohabitation. Mm -hmm. Is this what Jesus means in Matthew when he speaks of the days of Noah, marriage, and the end times? And could this possibility have any ties to the man of sin possibly being a result of such things? 
Yeah, I, I mean, we we did a little bit of this in the in the head covering, you know, episode. I mean, Paul is trying to get the Corinthians to do the right thing in terms of sexual modesty and, of course, sexual fidelity uh, within marriage. And again, because you know he has this concern and other concerns. Frankly, he's talking to the Corinthians, and they must have done just about everything, you know, under the sun in this area. But anyway. You know, those things matter, again, for New Covenant living, for New Testament living. Of, of course, why wouldn't they? You know, fidelity and modesty and whatnot. You know, and Paul is, you know, he, he's speaking to Gentiles here. I think they understand what, what what's going on clearly. Uh, as far as, you know, w- what's going on, what, is there some relationship between this and Matthew 24, or the Gospels, or, or, you know, the end times with the man of sin? You know, I, I don't think that there's any direct proof, any direct even evidence, that the Antichrist figure has anything to do with Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Now, the key word there is direct. You did have people, you know, like Irenaeus, that considered Genesis 6, 1 through 4 to be a possible backdrop, that there may be some sort of indirect tie-in uh, between Genesis 6, 1 through 4 and the Antichrist, again, the, the man of sin. So his argument, you know, it was more peripheral, more sort of character based. You know, he he ties it in with the the idea that that the the Giborim of Genesis six were tyrants, and so he thinks that the man of sin is going to be a tyrant. In other words, I, Irenaeus will will talk about Genesis six one through four in relationship to the Antichrist figure, but he never says anything like that cohabitation is going to happen again to produce the Antichrist. He never says anything like that. Neither does anybody else. Neither does any text. Now, personally, I, I think there are peripheral, indirect connections between the Antichrist figure and the, the sin of the Watchers, and you know what happens in Genesis six one through four. I, let me just you know bring that all down to this point. I don't think there's any direct connection between these two things: Genesis six one through four, the Nephilim, and the, and the Antichrist. Okay, I do think there are peripheral, indirect suggestive sort of connections that are not clear, but again, that, that, that may indicate that there's something about that event that, that has a role to play in the Antichrist figure. I know that's, that's kind of a convoluted way to say it, but it, I think it's better than just saying indirect versus direct. Uh, back to the Matthew 24 thing, I've commented on that before, I think even in a Q&A, I don't think Matthew 24 has any connection to Genesis 6, 1 through 4, because there are no textual connections there. The, the, the terminology for marrying and intermarriage in Matthew 24 is not the terminology the Septuagint uses for Genesis 6. If it was, I would change my tune on this. To me, that would be telegraphing a connection, but it just isn't there. And the rest of the things that are described in Matthew 24 about what people were doing before the flood entirely refer to the human population of Noah's day. So to me, it's cheating to take four or five things that are described in Matthew 24, pluck one of them out, and say, oh, this is about the Nephilim. Okay, that that to me is not legitimate hermeneutics. But again, if there was a connection via the Septuagint to that passage, well, that would be a little different because then, then to me, again, if you've listened to the podcast long enough, you know, those kinds of things are important to me because the writer is trying to draw our attention back to a specific passage by virtue of the Septuagint. But that does not occur in Matthew 24. 